On March 20th in 2003, President George W. Bush declared war on Iraq and launched Operation Iraqi Freedom, which was later renamed as Operation New Dawn. Primarily the reason for the war was the potential threat of Iraq possessing and potentially using weapons of mass destruction. Once it was proven that the weapons were not in existence, the focus of the war shifted to aiming to remove Saddam Hussein from power and to ensure that there would be no threat of weapons of mass destruction. Bush was determined to stay committed to the cause, regardless of the length and difficulty of the war. The United States has great respect for the Iraqi citizens and their culture, and aimed to help the country. The U.S. was successful in removing the president of Iraq from power. However, as a result of the war, the U.S. and Iraq both suffered tremendous casualties. Almost 4,500 U.S. soldiers were killed, and over 32,000 were injured. The Iraqi soldiers suffered close to 100,000 casualties. The war caused many consequences for the citizens of Iraq. They would have to completely rebuild their society and also their cities, which were destroyed as a result of U.S. invasions. The landscape of Iraq definitely caused obstacles for the U.S. Army. It was hard to keep security in Baghdad. Close air support was also very limited. U.S. soldiers would be shot at from buildings or mosques, which made it difficult to shoot back since the shooters were usually unseen and the army was not allowed in mosques. The community is very diverse in their reactions to the U.S. soldiers being present. Some neighborhoods were very grateful for the U.S. soldiers. Others were angry with them and hated them for reasons such as a bomb going astray or if they exposed a friend or family member as a bad person. Paul Pennell graduated from Clarence Senior High School in 2006. Paul, after being heavily influenced by his recruiter and the terrorist attacks on September 11, 2001, joined the U.S. Army. Paul spent one year in Iraq, then four months, and then eight months, with two weeks in between each duration. Paul's job is in human intelligence, and there are two parts to Paul's job, interrogations and source operations. Interrogations are not used to determine guilt, but to determine what a person knows. In some situations, a person may be detained against their will for an interrogation. The second part of his job, source operations, deals with finding information based on commander's orders. Saving lives is very rewarding for Paul, as he genuinely loves what he does. Paul was the leader of his team. He had to make sure things were done properly and legally. His team consisted of an assistant team leader, two other people to help with the operations, and another person who was an interpreter. Paul had the responsibility of making sure soldiers had a place to stay, making sure they had enough food and ammunition, time to rest, access to mail, and access to call home. Reports had timelines and Paul was responsible for making sure they were completed on time. Temperatures in Iraq ranged from 100 degrees to 110 degrees. Paul says his least favorite part of the being in Iraq was the climate. This was because of the weight of the equipment. A backpack usually weighed up to 50 pounds, a gun and helmet weighed about 7 pounds each, and the bulletproof vest with ammunition weighed up to 40 pounds. Paul's training focused primarily on how to ask questions and how to properly debrief events. Paul was trained to ask questions pertaining to every systematic detail such as what kind of hair color, style, and length does a person have? Do they have thin eyebrows or bushy eyebrows? A round or pointy nose? And does the person have a scar or birthmark? Paul was trained to be extremely detailed when describing a person. Paul was also trained in lie detection and taught how to analyze behavioral symptoms such as body language, eye movement, rate of speech, and sentence structure. Paul was not able to elaborate on a lot of information due to the fact that an extensive amount of information is classified. Paul is able to share what he does, but not how he does it. He is unable to talk about the strategies and methodologies he uses. He is also unable to reveal how he gets people to talk when they are being interrogated. There is a dramatic difference between the small bases and big bases. Bases could be the size of a small home or miles wide. On small bases, there was no way to shower or contact home. There were also no bathrooms on small bases. Soldiers went to the bathroom in barrels, and after, kerosene was poured on the barrels and they would be burned. Soldiers would go as long as 34 days without showering. The food on small bases was plain bagged food. Once, a refrigeration unit was blown up, and for 10 days, soldiers had to eat bagged Otis Spunkmeyer muffins, which had an expiration date of about 3 years. On big bases, soldiers were able to shower every night. They also had access to phones and internet. On the bigger bases, the soldiers had access to full meals such as steak and lobster. Every time a soldier was killed, all forms of communication were shut off. This was called a blackout. 
The purpose of a blackout was to prevent people from talking about someone's death before their family was notified. Paul remembers each day and scenario as being different. On a typical day, they would wake up and take inventory of their guns, goggles, and radios. After doing this, they would make sure their trucks were ready to go to the tech operations center. Here they would find out what happened overnight while they were asleep. A relaxing day would consist of report writing or meetings. On some days, Paul and his team could get away with taking a day or two off just to relax and play games like frisbee. Relaxing days also consisted of talking to and making friends with the locals. There were also days that were not so relaxing. On these days, Paul and his team would be called for missions, they would board helicopters, and occasionally break into houses. Missions could last from 40 minutes to several days. While on missions, one person on the team would take pictures of everything, which made it impossible for anyone to lie about an event. The army had an incentive locker from which they would give food or medicine to people who worked with them. While in Iraq, Paul dealt with many emotions, such as feelings of uncertainty and helplessness. These emotions are a result of indirect fire. Paul describes indirect fire as being worse than direct fire. Direct fire would occur when they were walking around the neighborhood and they would be shot at from the rooftops of civilian buildings. Indirect fire occurred almost every day. During indirect fire, mortars would land on bases from miles away and blow up. No one was ever certain about where they would come from or land. Mortars would make a whistling sound and when it was heard, the soldiers were supposed to run to the bunkers. After a while, soldiers became so used to the mortars and so numb that they would just stay in their sleeping quarters and accept the fact that they could possibly die. Indirect fire resulted in a feeling of constant stress among soldiers. This was because when the mortar went off, soldiers had to account for all their men in the middle of the night. With the men being so exhausted, they could easily miss someone who was going off to the bathroom and find out in the morning that they were no longer alive. These incidents of direct fire have caused Paul to have a recurring nightmare. Paul dreams that while he is laying in his sleeping quarters, a mortar hits the base and he is unable to move or get up, which leaves him with a feeling of helplessness. While in Iraq, a German shepherd saved Paul's life and many other lives. Two leaders, both enemies of each other, were sat down by Paul and his team to attempt to resolve the issues between them. Paul's mission was to report back to the commander of what the situation was. The two leaders had agreed to meet on what Paul assumed to be mutual ground. They met with the leaders in a small house with only two rooms, along with 30 other people for security purposes. About 10 minutes into the meeting, everyone was eating and making small talk. Paul recalls one of the leaders in his aide getting up and leaving, saying that they wanted to get something for the soldiers. Paul saw this as an opportunity to talk to the one leader without the other one listening. In the middle of a conversation with one leader, Paul heard a knock on the door. At the door was a lieutenant who asked Paul if he wanted a bomb dog to clear the area. Paul, believing that they were safe, told the lieutenant that it was not needed. Paul's assistant team leader eventually convinced Paul that clearing the area wouldn't hurt. The reason that Paul said no was because the information and conversations at the meeting were secretive even from the U.S. people. Paul would allow just the dog and its handler into the room. The dog came in and began searching in concentric circles. From the time the leader left to the time the dog came into the room was about two minutes. When making more small talk with the one leader, out of the corner of Paul's eye, he saw the dog sit down. Paul knew that when a dog sits down, it found something. Not expecting the worst, Paul believed that the dog had just found an RPG or a grenade, or just weapons that a leader kept in his house. After the dog sat down, the handler asked Paul if he wanted to investigate. Luckily, Paul agreed to an investigation. They opened up a door and found two 55mm artillery shells wired together and rigged up to a cell phone. As soon as they saw this, everyone evacuated the house in the village. A truck containing a radio jammer was outside of the house at the time, which would have prevented the bomb from going off. If the German Shepherd did not find the bomb, or the truck outside had moved, everyone in the village would have been dead within two minutes. This incident weighed heavy on Paul. He could have been responsible for the deaths of over 20 people, because he originally said no for the dog investigating. The one leader was willing to kill his own people just to be able to kill a few Americans. As a result of a German Shepherd saving his life, Paul adopted a German Shepherd of his own and named him Valor.